tonight we are honored and privileged to have with us a recipient of the 1983 Pulitzer Prize, Cliff Tryons of the Jackson, Mississippi Clarion Ledger. Tryon shares the Pulitzer with two fellow reporters and two editorial writers for an aggressive investigative series on public education in Mississippi. In the span of 24 days, the Clarion Ledger published 51 stories and 27 editorials addressing the state's much needed education reform. Tryons, an Ohio State University journalism graduate, joined the newspaper in 1979. Before joining the Clarion Ledger, Tryons covered city and county governments for the Valley News Dispatch in New Kensington, Pennsylvania. At this time, I present to you Cliff Tryons. <laughs> Well, I'm extremely honored to be here, and I'll tell you, this Pulitzer thing has really been something. I am convinced that it's much nicer to be behind a camera, behind a notepad, than it is in front of it, and I'm extremely nervous, so bear with me. Um, I've also brought my stopwatch, and I promise not to bore you. I've set my time. Okay. Um, I thought it might be interesting just to tell you a little bit about what the newsroom was like when we won this Pulitzer, because Lord knows we never embarked on this project with the idea we were going to win any prizes. Uh, it was really, with the exception of the series, it was a very spontaneous uh, undertaking. Um, we heard the week before the Pulitzers were announced that we had made it past the first round of judging. And that enough was, you know, had us all extremely nervous and excited, but uh, we tried to tell ourselves the whole time there's no way we could possibly win a Pulitzer Prize because nobody really seriously thinks about that, at least not in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, it got to be the day that they were going to announce the awards and our editor called us into the office, Fred uh, Anklum, Nancy Weaver, myself, and one of the editorial writers, and said, I want you to be here from 1 to 2 o'clock. They announced the Pulitzer at 2. And uh, he had two cases of champagne on ice in a room just in case we won a Pulitzer Prize, <laughs> which was, by itself, was an outrageous thing because uh, the paper was owned by a Baptist family before Gannett bought it, and the idea of having two cases of champagne in the newsroom was just unthinkable a couple years ago. Um, it got to be two o'clock, and we hadn't heard a word about it, and uh, I had held out hope that maybe we still had it, and there was just some delay in the announcement. Um, I had, to backtrack a little bit, I uh, used to smoke a lot pack a day for five years and I quit a few years back and have since run four marathons and the day that they announced the Pulitzers a year ago I'd run the Boston Marathon and prided myself in being in great physical condition I immediately started smoking cigarettes again <laughs> it's a nervous wreck Nancy Weaver just quit and she started smoking again too Fred was extremely calm said don't worry about it we haven't won don't get nervous but he had rings of perspiration about a foot deep under both arms um, about five after two, a friend of one of the reporters from the Chicago Sun-Times called and said that we had won. Of course, we didn't believe it because we were watching the wire, and then a few minutes later, it moved on the wire, and it, it was just crazy. It was like the locker room after the World Series. It's something we can't possibly describe, but uh, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the project, and I'm uh, uh, going to give you a few statistics here. I'm not, not going to bore you too much with it, but... Um, Mississippi, as you may know, is, has a reputation nationwide for being on the bottom in a lot of areas, in education particularly so. Um, Mississippi, at the time, the legislature was called to Jackson to, uh, by the governor for a special session, had a 42 percent dropout rate in the public schools. Only four states in the country spent less per student than Mississippi. Mississippi spent about $1,965 compared to the national average of $2,600 um, nationwide. Um, about a quarter of every dollar spent on public education came from the federal government. Mississippi has the highest ratio of federal dollars of any state in the country because we have the lowest per capita income and uh, terribly poor. Um, Mississippi is the only state in the nation that did not have public finance kindergartens. Mississippi had the lowest paid uh, school teachers in the nation. Mississippi had no compulsory school attendance law, so uh, anybody who didn't want to go to school didn't have to go to school. Um, teacher certification standards in Mississippi are so low 
that only 3% of teachers taking this test nationwide failed to pass it. Um, also, the, the school districts in Mississippi were in total disarray. There's 153 school districts, uh, five different types, op each operating under a different set of laws. Uh, so needless to say, uh, there were severe problems in Mississippi in education, and of course, the governor's pitch was that good education is tied to industrial development and progress for the state in many other ways. Um, the paper began an investigative series. Well, I, I hesitate to use the word investigative because really I think of investigative as being the kind of thing where you uncover some hidden problem. And really, education has always been a problem in Mississippi. It was just waiting to be um, exposed in, in a series, and that's simply what we did. Uh, Fred Ankle and Nancy Weaver worked on this for six months, and uh, it ran eight consecutive days prior to the special session in December. It was December 6th when it started. It was a two-week session. Um, well, as she mentioned, by the time it was all over, we had written 51 stories and 27 editorials in 24 days, and needless to say, it was a very concerted, um, unified effort on the part of the paper. All facets involved, the, the investigative team, I was involved in the legislative coverage and the editorial page. What the legislature did in a matter of two weeks, and this is, keep in mind, it's a very conservative legislature that uh, I don't think by any stretch of the imagination could, you could call progressive. Uh, in two weeks, they, they passed a bill that mandated public finance kindergartens beginning in the fall of 1986. They began a reading aid program, which involves getting reading assistance to help teachers in grades one through three to help students develop reading skills. And you know, the illiteracy rate in, in Mississippi is just horrendous. Um, it, re it, it passed a uh, compulsory school attendance law for the first time. It also uh, provided a $1,000 across the board pay increase for teachers in addition to other incentives. And it also provided for a study of consolidation of school districts to provide more uniformity in public education. And it, it increased the teacher certification standards. And finally, uh, there, there are other reforms I'm not mentioning, but it, uh, the legislature also authorized a study of the problem of teachers teaching subjects that they're not certified in. You might have, if you've been paying attention to this uh, national commission that just came out with a study, that's a a uh, very great problem in math and science, teachers teaching math and science but not being certified in those subjects. Now, per, the most significant thing about what the legislature did is, and again, keep in mind this is a state with the lowest per capita income of any state in the nation, passed a $110 annual tax bill. And this is in the middle of a recession in an election year. Um, nobody ever would have predicted that the legislature would have done something like that, but uh, for reasons I'll explain a little bit later, uh, um, they were forced into doing it. Um, also significant is that my newspaper, probably for the first time in its uh, history, took a very unified and progressive stand. Uh, um, the development of the newspaper really began probably seven years ago. Uh, uh, the paper was owned for years, decades, by a very conservative segregationalist family in Jackson and uh, uh, was a textbook example of bad journalism for most of its history. Um, about six or seven years ago, a younger member of the family got into a position of power, started to beef up the staff, hired a lot of young, aggressive reporters, uh, and a lot of them from the North, um, and started to undertake projects such as uh, studying police brutality, uh, inequities in the judicial system, uh, an investigation of poverty in the Mississippi Delta where there's a lot of sharecropping and, and uh, poor labor. Uh, and, and this is something that the community wasn't used to, the state wasn't used to, and, and, and particularly the legislature wasn't used to. They, they were dumbfounded, I think particularly by the editorials. Uh, uh, they had had very favorable treatment by the past ownership. But uh, Gannett Corporation bought our newspaper, and, and we were a little apprehensive about that because, you know, I think most journalists don't want to be acquired by a newspaper chain. But as it turned out, the editor they brought in was a Jackson native, and he was very instrumental in writing very, very hard-hitting editorials. Uh, 
um, making no bones about the fact that education reform is what they had to do. Um, he, uh, in the editorials, they, they created what they called a hall of shame in which they listed legislators who voted against the education reforms. And to this day, uh, that, now that was in December, that was a special session. The regular session came after that, and not a week went by when, when a number of legislators, legislators wouldn't get up and moan about the uh, editorials and the treatment they got in the newspaper. They passed the bill, but they, they didn't do it willingly, and they still complain about it. But uh, I think they've seen the handwriting on the wall, and they're not going to get the kind of treatment they've gotten in the past. The governor um, had tried to get these reforms passed two years previous, or no, three years previous, and this was his last year. He's the lame duck governor. And the state law does not allow a governor to run two consecutive terms. So this was, for him, this was it or nothing. So he went out on, and conducted a series of forums across the state trying to drum up public support. Um, another thing that happened that was unusual was that uh, uh, special interest groups, and I'm talking now about like the uh, Mississippi Association of Educators and groups like that put heavy pressure on the, on the legislature, which is something that had never been done before. You, you would see uh, uh, legislators who were opposed to the education reform surrounded by 10 teachers, you know, tried to tell him why he should vote for the package. And, and obviously that, that had an effect too. So I think there were a number of forces at work, uh, and some that I'm not even sure I know what they are. It's just uh, things started to happen, and you couldn't really plot all of it. But slowly but surely, the sentiment was shifting in favor of the reforms and to the amazement of everybody. I mean, it, even after it passed, I think most people couldn't believe that it had finally passed, but uh, um, the, the favorable national publicity that the state of Mississippi has received and our newspapers received has been uh, something that uh, Mississippians haven't experienced the four years I've been there, and it's just been a, a wonderful thing to see. And I, uh, I, I have to say that I've never been more proud before the Pulitzer. It was just uh, it was something that you got caught, you felt like you were making history, and it was, uh, it was, it was a great thing. And, and to win the Pulitzer was just the icing on the cake. And I, uh, gosh, I wish, I wish everybody could experience that feeling, but uh, I don't think I'll ever experience it again, let's put it that way. Um, let me see, let me go through my notes here. Um, I want to say a little bit about newspaper work in general uh, based on my experience because uh, I'm not an investigative reporter. I just cover government and, and I've often felt that the kind of work that I do isn't really uh, award-winning work simply because I cover the nuts and bolts of government. It's not, it's not always very flashy and it's not an expose, but it's stuff that I think is extremely important and, I, and, and I've often felt that sometimes it, it's been obscured by the more sensational types of reporting. So um, I, never, I never thought that I would be involved in something like this, but I would encourage anybody who feels that investigative reporting is the only kind of reporting that has real merit to immediately dispel that from your mind, because I, I, f I feel that uh, the day-to-day -day satisfaction you get from covering government and telling people things they need to know about what their representatives are doing uh, is the most valuable kind of information they can possibly receive. Um, I would also encourage students who are thinking ahead about careers to, um, to look at small, medium-sized markets. Uh, uh, when I came up through school, you know, I think everybody, as they, as they look into the future, aspire to, to work in a major metropolitan market like a Chicago or a New York or Los Angeles. But frankly, I'm not sure that the opportunities that I've gotten would have been available to me in those places. Uh, um, I've worked at the Clarion Ledger four years. I've only been, I graduated from college in, in spring of 77, so I haven't been in the business that long. But at the Clarion Ledger, I've had an opportunity to cover uh, state government. I covered, I was in our Washington Bureau for about five months, and then now this Pulitzer thing. So I mean, the opportunities that you can find in a smaller market where all the good stories haven't been exposed um, are tremendous. Uh, I can think in Mississippi right now, there, I think there's another potential Pulitzer Prize just in, in looking at the, the health care situation in Mississippi. You know, it's, it's just as bad as the public education. And it's just waiting to be done. And, and all it needs is a good, responsible newspaper 
to go about doing that project, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll get about that. Um, I know this is going to sound a little bit corny, but I, I really believe that that hard work, that a reporter with hard, that works hard and has strong convictions is going to find a lot of success in the business and a lot of satisfaction. Uh, uh, it, it's a lot of hard work and drudgery a lot of the time, but I think there's, there's uh, benefits in newspaper work and in journalism that you can't find in any other job. Every day is a, a new experience and you get feedback and you get the satisfaction out of doing something that you think is serving the public good. Uh, I don't think there's too many jobs where you can get that kind of satisfaction. In fact, uh, I was talking about working in Mississippi and, and working in the small, medium-sized markets. I went back to Ohio Christmas time and, and talked with some friends. I have one friend that works for the Associated Press in Cleveland and another friend that works on the Akron Beacon Journal, which is a Knight Ritter paper, the first Knight Ritter paper. And they just couldn't understand why I was in Mississippi. And I, you know, I was trying to tell them, well, about this education reform package and, and what a great thing it was. And, just didn't seem to compute with them. Well, yeah, yeah, I'm hoping that they watch the paper having the Pulitzer turn now because I knew what I was talking about. Um, just to get back on the satisfactions of, of working in this business, uh, um, one thing that I've found is that in, in your own small way, no matter what beat you cover, I think you can really do something that makes a difference. Uh, um, you may not win an award. And I, up until this time, I was really rather skeptical of journalism awards. There were times when I thought we should have won awards and we didn't win awards. And uh, even now, you know, I think, I think they're great when you win them. But, uh, you know, when you don't win one, I don't think that means that the work you do is not, not valid or not uh, meritorious. And, and uh, I think as long as you know that you're doing something that's worthwhile, it, you know, that's the, the satisfaction enough. At least it always has been for me. So, I mean, everything that's been happening now is just, just uh, makes it all the better. Um, I don't know that I have a whole lot more to say. I'd, I'd like to open the floor to questions, uh, um, if anybody has any. Please. Yeah. Uh, money is, it comes out of the state's general operating fund, which is a collection of, of sales tax, income tax, taxes, and, and a variety of other types of taxes. And, and uh, that is another problem. Um, the state has not funded public education adequately, and the legislature uh, would like to put more financial responsibility on the school districts. And there are attempts to try to, to look at the whole system of financing education in Mississippi to see if there's a better way that it can be done. But right now, it's just, they just draw revenues, a lump sum, out of the general fund, and it's distributed on a formula to these school districts. But as I pointed out, there are so many different kinds of school districts and so many different school districts that a lot of things need to be straightened out before a better system of financing can be, can be developed. Is there, is there a local Raise their money from property taxes? That's the they, the part of their financing comes from property taxes, so yeah. Are there in, in uh, the situation of rich schools, poor schools, such as? Great inequities, terrible inequities. That's, that's again, that's part of the problem. Um, another thing I didn't point out is that one reason financing of education in Mississippi has been so bad is because when they integrated schools in the early 70s, private academies sprung up by the score in Mississippi and a great, great number of people who in other states would be going to public schools are going to private academies. So in the populace, you don't have the public support for bond issues or for tax measures to finance public schools because so many of the people are in private schools and have no interest in, in supporting public schools. That was one of the big arguments against public finance kindergartens. There were and, and there are racial overtones in a lot of this stuff, but um, some people spoke of the kindergartens as a babysitting service for blacks. And 
that was one source of opposition to the kindergartens. Um, you may have seen 2020 did a piece on, on what happened to the education program the year before. Uh, the Speaker of the House, who was opposed to kindergartens, um, well, there was a vote in the House to reconsider a vote whereby the, the kindergarten program had been defeated. And all you needed was a majority vote to call the bill back up and vote on it again. There had been some lobbying. The people thought they had the votes to pass it. Um, on, on the vote to reconsider, uh, it was a voice vote, and the yeas clearly had it. And the Speaker of the House said the nays have it. He gaveled the, the day closed. It was a deadline day, which meant that if you didn't pass the bill that day, it was permanently dead that session. And he just gaveled it shut and walked off the floor and killed kindergartens single-handedly. So that's the kind of thing that was being contended with. And what is the scope of education reform in Mississippi? Would you say it's brought up to the standard of the rest of the nation? Are there things there that you might consider model? Changes, I think by and large it's bringing it up to the standard of the rest of the nation. Um, uh, kindergartens is a perfect example. That's not something that's exceptional. It's something that every state in the country has except Mississippi. The teacher salaries were the lowest in Mississippi and, and they were just bringing those up. Um, and that's been Mississippi's problem so much of the time is just trying to, to catch up with the rest of the nation. Um, I, it was interesting on Nightline a couple weeks ago uh, they were discussing this recent report that came out on the national level about education. And uh, I think Ted Koppel asked um, uh, Tara Bell, the education secretary, about you know, the Reagan administration's stand on, on financing of education. Obviously, they're cutting back on their support of, of education on the federal level. And ironically, uh, Tara Bell cited Mississippi as an example of a state that came forth and used its own resources to better its situation. The only thing he didn't point out was that in doing that, Mississippi only got to a level where it was approaching other states, and really they, they were not going be any, any beyond that. And so I think it was kind of an incomplete picture that he presented. Did your newspaper offer any suggestions uh, to improve you know, the educational system in Mississippi? Uh, basically, the, the newspaper supported the package that the governor was proposing. Um, I think uh, I think everybody was surprised that we accomplished as much as, as the state did, and to try to do anything beyond that might have been pointless. I think um, the editorial people on our paper realized that, that what was needed was a unified, consolidated effort, and so they put you know the clout behind what the governor was proposing, and uh, uh, it was basically restricted to that. In your first uh, week of starting the exposure, the first week of the series, or at any time thereafter, did you receive any kind of economic pressure from businesses advertising with you, or any kind of community pressure or legislative pressure? Most of the pressure seemed to be coming from the legislature. They just didn't like being told editorially what to do. And, and, and I don't think something that was done that hadn't been done on a regular basis was the run, we ran roll call votes on every crucial vote so that the, the constituents knew exactly how their legislators were voting. It seems like a simple thing, but um, I, I'd say that most papers probably don't do that except on the very mo most vital issues. And we did it routinely on every, I'd say just about every um, facet of, of the package. So. Um, most of the pressure was <laughs> came from the legislature directed at us. The business community was very much behind it because they realized, you know, you hear so much about high technology industries and that kind of thing, and, and business realizes if they're going to have a good workforce, a skilled workforce, they need education. So, um, you know, you had groups like the Chamber of Commerce and, and the Economic Council in Mississippi, which uh, haven't always taken stands that were perceived as being for the public good, you know, more business oriented. We're very much behind the education stuff. Um, so that was another thing that I think the legislators weren't used to. They, these people they could usually count on as friends were, were forcing them to try to deal with this education issue also.
Um, I don't think there was so much uh, overt reaction. I think in the community there was a lot of skepticism. Uh, um, I think the, the old line part of the community uh, was skeptical about what the corporation would do, you know, what direction they would take, whether they would depart from the past. Um, the black community in, in Mississippi, I think, has never really uh, put much faith in the Clarion Ledger because the Clarion Ledger never had much to say to them. And, and one good <coughs> consequence of this whole project, I think, is that they now realize that the Clarion Ledger is an objective news source that they can count on for information. And, and, uh, and so, you know, you find, I think you find black leaders in the community are much more willing to talk to you now. And I think blacks in general in Mississippi are finding, uh, with some recent elections, are finding that they have more clout and they're, they're exercising their vote more regularly. And, and uh, so that was, that was one consequence. But I, I, I want to point out that the, really the change started before Gannett bought the paper. It, it started, as I said, maybe six or seven years ago, and it's been a slow process. And, and this uh, education package in the Pulitzer is really the culmination of something that, that's been slowly developing. Um, yeah. Besides those speeches, I'm sure you must have to continue your your day to day reporting. And as you continue to cover state government, do you find any personal hostility directed to you? I was concerned about that. I, I thought that, um, particularly during the special session, that uh, uh, people wouldn't talk to me or deal with me honestly because they were uh, afraid the paper would come down on them, and I. I was very surprised to find out that they could make the distinction between the editorial page and the news pages. I, I didn't get one bit of criticism about how we wrote our legislative stories, because frankly, uh, I've always found that if, if you write the story accurately, they have no grounds to really criticize you, and they won't go out on the limb trying to say that you misrepresented a situation if they know it, it's not misrepresented. So I, I had no problem with that at all. Uh, it was mostly directed at the editorial page. Uh, uh, Senator, one very powerful senator has been in the legislature for 31 years, um, got up on the floor of the Senate a number of times and criticized the editorial page and the editor by name, you know, on the floor of the Senate. You know, uh, it just showed how, how, how badly they were hurting by this editorial pressure. It was very unusual. And, of course, you know, we're reporters sitting down writing the whole thing. It was kind of amusing, but enjoyable. <laughs> yeah. From your experience there in Mississippi, have you developed a personal feeling about the administration's tax credit proposal for uh, parents with students in private school? Hmm. Well, it's interesting you should mention that, because when I was in Washington, uh, um, you might recall that there was a, uh, there was a flap about um, the whole private school issue. Uh, some of the, uh, when the tax exempt status was originally revoked, it, it was a result of a, of a, a Mississippi school. And uh, um, there's quite a bit of controversy up there about that. I, gosh, I don't know. I haven't really researched that enough to, to, to make a real informed opinion on it. I, <laughs> I have personal feelings, but I'm not sure I ought to express those. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think, a I think after it was all said and done, they, they acknowledged that we did a good job. But at, at the time, uh, uh, the people who were covering the legislature, most of them were old, old hands. You know, I've been there. See, the Associated Press people have been there, one guy 10 years, another guy 20 years. And, and uh, UPI was the same. And the guy from the Memphis paper had been there for eight years. And they, they had been there long enough that I guess I think they weren't quite as sensitive to some of the things that were happening there. Um, Fred Anklem and myself were pretty much rookies at covering the legislature, but I think in this case it proved an advantage. We weren't, uh, we weren't, uh, we were very sensitive to what all people were saying. We didn't just necessarily key on the legislative leaders. Um, I think we were more prone to, to say what we saw and not, not accept what, what some legislative leader was saying, 
And uh, I, we, we really kind of, I think we attacked the whole thing, or covered the whole thing very uh, more comprehensively and, and more honestly than they did, not because they chose to ignore something, but I think, I think there's something to be said for um, reporters changing beats and changing situations occasionally because uh, they just didn't seem to be as responsive to some of the things that were going on as Fred and I were. It's, it's been picking up ever since Gannett bought the paper, but I think that's only because um, the, the family that owned the paper before was an old family, and, and I think their business practices were somewhat antiquated, and Gannett came in, and of course, she, you know, Gannett knows how to make a buck, and they've gone into very aggressive marketing, um, you know, techniques, and, and I think they're, they've opened new bureaus in the state. And in North Mississippi, the commercial appeal from Memphis really has had a lock on that circulation up there. And now Gannett is trying to break into that circulation area. So I mean, I think, I'm not sure the Pulitzer really had anyth has anything to do with our improvements in circulation. I think it's just Gannett is more aggressive in their, in their marketing. A lot of promotions, they, they become very involved civically in sponsoring civic events and things like that, and, which a lot of newspapers do. Must be some more questions. What lies ahead for you? I mean, afterwards, it seems like that would be a key. Yeah, everybody says, "Have you gotten job offers?" I, I got one. I'm not sure if it was serious, but I, I, I don't intend to go anywhere for at least another year. We have our state elections coming up, and I've never covered a statewide election, so I'm going to cover the governor's race. And uh, I, my, my attitude has been that I would stay. I gave myself two years when I first came to Mississippi, but. You know, as long as I think there's an opportunity for me to learn and, and grow, I, I think it would be uh, pointless to leave early. I think you should stay and get as much out of the experience as you can. And, of course, I, I could tell when I first came to Clarion Ledger that it was going places. The editors told me that, and I saw some of the projects they had done, and they convinced me, and I've stayed twice as long as I thought I would, and I guess I'm going to stay a while longer. But uh, uh, I'd eventually like to go into a bigger market and then maybe after 10 years as a reporter maybe get into uh, editing on a city desk or something, but I just take each year as it goes by and see, what's ha see what happens. We're, we're going to work on a story um, sometime soon about trying to take a head count on how many legislators are running for re-election. Uh, I could be wrong, but I've, I've heard of a, a great number of legislators who have said they're not running for re-election, and I suspect that maybe uh, it's going to be a greater number than in the past, and I think possibly because a lot of the old legislators who were plugged into that old power structure can see that things are never going to be quite the same, that there are lobbying groups now and, and newspaper pressure and public pressure and, and blacks are more likely to run for public office now. And I suspect that maybe we're going to have a, a higher attrition rate this time around simply because uh, being in the legislature isn't going to be as fun for a lot of these people as it used to be. <laughs> I, I really believe that. I, you know, I, uh, we're going to try to take a good head count pretty soon and see what we can find out. There are some, uh, some people who were elected uh, to their first term, um, which just is just, has just ended, um, particularly stretched out and asserted themselves this regular session after the education stuff passed. We had a big utility reform package, which revamped the whole system of utility regulation in the state. And, and some of the key people who helped push that thing through were first term legislators. And a number of people observed that that, you know, how unusual that was. And I think there is a whole new group of people who next time, if they get reelected, are going to try to, to ease their way into the power structure. And I, I, I talked to a political scientist from uh, Mississippi State University about this, and I told him that I thought that maybe things were changing and, and that these young people would get into the power structure and, and, and start to change things in the state. And he said, no. He said, I've seen this many times before. He says, they're going to get in there and then they're going to end up being just like the other guys, you know, and I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. I, he said I was a little more idealistic than he was, and I, I probably am, but 
I think things may change. Um, before the last elections, uh, this is a, another great Mississippi story. There was a 15-year um, lawsuit in federal court to uh, reapportion the, leg the legislative districts. Um, Mississippi had a number of multi-member districts, and, and what that does is you get you get a majority. You get a majority. Let's say a, a, a district that's slightly majority black. You make it a multi-member district. Um, uh, and elect a number of, of people out of that district, it diminishes the chances of a black getting elected. You know, after the court suit was decided in favor of the plaintiffs, it created single member districts, which were smaller, and there were a number of areas of high black concentration that could not be drawn out of districts without gerrymandering. So as a result, by, by going to single member districts, you automatically enhance the chances, and you went from having two blacks in the legislature to 17 in one election. And chances are that some more will get elected this time around. The state is 35 percent black. It's the highest um, percentage black state in the country. So. No more? Well, thanks a lot. I hope I didn't bore you too much. <laughs>